Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater. This is uh, Socialing the Distance, your favorite program on Run Blog Run. Today, we have Ryan Whiting. He's the 2012-2014 World Indoor Shot Put Champion. He's also the coach of Desert High Performance in Phoenix. Ryan, good morning. Thank you for getting up so early. <laughs> good morning. Finally got to sleep in for once today. Wow. Is your Now, is your son already doing school this morning, or is he... Uh, uh, he starts some days at eight, some days at ten. So we're okay. we're lucky we got yeah ten today. So he That's starts in about fifty minutes or so. Okay, um, I talked to Chase Ely last week, who was a total blast, and she was talking about being coached by you and how much you brought her. She was in a place where she was kind of transitioning, to kind of getting out of it, and you uh, you brought her back. <laughs> Talk to me about. Talk to me about transitioning to coaching, and then I want to talk about your shot put career too. Um, so my my transition to coaching kind of started while I was throwing. I, I would work with um, – I trained at Penn State for I think it was five or six years, mm -hmm. and they had a good ability athletics program. So people who were recently disabled or military veterans. So I started working with um, one guy named Sean who was just an Army vet, um, PTSI pretty bad and he had some issues um, some issues that he just needed to work through and I, I just enjoyed working with him and kind of it, it helped him deal with his anger a little bit he had three kids so they he'd bring yeah. them along and that's the kind of environment I grew up with with Glenn Thompson in Pennsylvania oh Glenn, yeah okay and fostered kids and they were always just around so it was kind of comfortable to me so I started helping out with those guys and then I started helping some couple amputees that were marine vets um, and I started kind of getting into coaching and figuring out what I could do for my own career, just like focusing on the fundamentals a little bit more and thinking of things in a different way that I hadn't thought of them in a while because the fundamentals were already kind of within me by that point. But it helped me recover from injury quicker. It helped me kind of get back to normal when I did have issues myself because I was thinking more readily about some of the fundamental stuff that I hadn't touched on in a while. And, and that started to interest me a little bit. And then I probably still had, that was, that would have been probably 2013 that I started coaching those guys. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of continued with that as I was at Penn State. And then I came out here and I coached a um, para-athlete named Sherrod. He was a rep on the refugee team okay. um, from, he was from Iran of, uh, originally. Yeah. And he was here as a refugee. So I coached him. Um, and we went to 2017 Worlds. Um that was my first like real coaching experience. Wow. 2017 para worlds, which was cool because I was still competing. So I was I was both coaching him um and getting ready to go on a plane to Rabat to, to yeah. compete myself. Yeah. Wow. So wow. So that was um that was an adventure. I mean, it might have been a little much in hindsight. I would have <laughs> wish I would have focused, but it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. And um kind of coming out of that, uh I made the decision to I mean, at least start thinking about retiring in 2018 and take kind of a pause and just set, see how it was being home with my family and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that was the off year and I, I enjoyed it. So I started coaching a little bit more high school and just kind of started sliding into that, that side of things. Um, I got a job at MCC Mesa community college with Steve Jacobs. Sure. And he's had great throwers and great, great programs kind of for years now. Yeah, And it was a good place to just kind of transition easily into coaching because the facility is, was, I mean, until recently, fairly open to um, professional athletes. Mm -hmm. So um, just transitioning some of my kids into that and I started enjoying it more and started realizing like I do have a lot to offer to, to a lot of people um, just because of my coaching heritage with the coaches that I've had. Um, I felt like I was lucky with Never really having a bad one. They're all very technically competent and varied enough that I got a lot, a lot of different points of view and kind of now looking at it from where I am, I had a lot of different points of view that helped me shape kind of what I think were the best things that they did and let go of the worst things that I felt that they did. Mm -hmm. So um, I felt pretty lucky with just having us. I mean, I had injuries and everything, but I felt very lucky that the people that I got to learn from and the people that I got to be around with, with Reese and Adam and um, the different ways Christian thought about it. And then some of the foreign guys and it's just, um, it started to come together in my head as like, Oh, I can, I actually have something to offer. So 
um i stuck with it a little bit and then chase and i met so that's cool um yeah and she she uh, yeah i mean that was kind of like if there's a meeting of fate that that was kind of it <laughs> lucas um lucas mckay who's the penn state coach um connected those dots mm-hmm. he knew i was out here training um with maggie and kind of at asu with blue trick and um connected the dots and we had lunch one day and i pretty much just flat out said you if i'm gonna help you out you need to turn you need to be a rotator because i feel like i have a doctorate in rotation and i have like a a bachelor's in the glide <laughs> and you, you probably want the best of me if we're going to do this so um yeah we started i threw her in the deep end i'm sure she told you that yes yes yeah. yes <laughs> it's kind of trial by fire but it, it it uh was my first real like commitment of time to be coaching mm-hmm. so i taught her the basics of rotation and kind of threw her at us nationals and she fouled out she came back um, wanting more so so we were off and running that fall and um cool yeah we switched and i think by january she was showing signs of throwing 19 meters and then indoor national she won her first one and that's probably the most nervous I've been at any meet. My first real coaching meet, even though there's no consequences at all, other than sure. other than um, getting the win. Uh, there's a story. Oh, I, I interviewed Emil Zadopek, the great Czech distance runner, and his wife was a javelin thrower, and she retired for four years and coached the javelin. And she got more nervous coaching the kids in the javelin that she went back to throwing again. She said that was less stressful. Oh yeah. Can, can, is that how your experience? Yeah. I mean, I, I always felt, I mean, whether, I mean, not at the beginning of my career, but I always felt probably at least the last two years of college and then into the pros, I felt fairly in, in control. I mean, I'd, I'd get the nerves and everything, but yeah, kind of have a better idea of how to direct them. And I knew I was, I never missed a world championship final. Like I, I, I was, I was pretty set competitively. I, I didn't have many, many uh, ticks or huge issues. Um, injury was my my kind of vein of my existence as a thrower. Um, but yeah, I felt the same way. I, I couldn't ima- I couldn't believe how nervous I was that first meet. And she's she's uh she was a new spinner and I know what that's like too. So that kind of stacked yeah. another layer of sure. of uh of crap on top. But she she pulled it out and I mean yeah it was it was pretty amazing. It's a it's a different feeling definitely than an athlete because now with her I've won national championships myself and she's won yeah. the next level is the world championships and the medal and the the real getting the real medals. So I think that'll be even more nerve wracking, but yeah, we'll get through it. Um, I went back into my notes and was looking at some things I put down about you in 2012 and so 2013 in Moscow. And, and um, I always like to watch you throw, but what the, the thing to me that was interesting is how you could control your emotion how relaxed you would be before then you were able to literally just, well, you didn't have to tear your shirt like our, our friends do, yeah. but you were able to just put it together in the throw. Was that something you had to practice? Yeah. And I, I never, like I always said, like I would yell if, if the throw uh, merited it. And yeah. Never, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I never had a throw that, that got me there. Um, <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, I was always pretty, pretty in control. I think my sophomore year in high school, I, I fouled out of my state meet and uh-huh. I went over, I have like a very, really, really vivid memory of it still, because it's kind of a decent turning point for me in my career. Mm-hmm. It was the point where I realized that like some sort of mental training was needed on top of, um, on top of the athletic training. And I didn't, that's kind of the point that they kind of merged together and I started understanding that you can control that side of things. So I was, I was really lucky in that I got to do that really early because it allowed me to get really the most out of every stage of my career because mm. I could go to bigger meets and know that I'd have a really good chance of PRing. And then when I got to Dumble, he added even more to that, that mental side of things. And now I have my whole career to draw on with teaching my athletes who I didn't realize that not many college coaches do the kind of mental training that I I did in college. So Mm -hmm. I get to train a lot of pros the way that I was, I mean, some of the things that I knew already in college. So there's a big bump 
um, in their performance or their confidence with just adding that extra layer of just being more sure of yourself and being able to execute in the moment. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I definitely trained and now knowing that it's something I trained and knowing how I did it and exactly how I got to, to the success that I got is, um, I have, I journaled a lot, so I have all the notes and that's cool. I know the things that I can, that were little like turning points for me so I can teach them to them a little bit faster than I had to learn them. Um, you hinted at what you've learned from different throwers. So I'm going to throw some throwers names out and ask you to give me a lesson that you learned from them. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, we'll start with one of my favorites, Christian Cantwell. Um, so he, he taught me more, like more than anything, he was really good. I mean, he's, you, you know, Christian, I mean, yeah. he's, he's abrasive at times. He, he runs his mouth and, you can say all the negative stuff you want about him, but when we're on the road and when you're with him, like he's, you're, you're his countryman, you're with him. You are, he yeah. will take care of you. So I always felt, um, they paid for a lot of things. When I first got out there, you don't have a lot of money at the beginning. Yeah. Christian would just because he wanted someone to go with, take me to the casino, get me food. Like just, just, uh, he just, so someone would be with him. Yeah. Um, um and then that turned into a lot of his his mental stuff was just full force cockiness. Yeah. But one thing that he taught me above anything was that when you get to these big meets, you you have to take your time as yours. You can't you, you can't look at what anyone else is doing. You got to take the ring. If the ring's empty, it's your ring. Mm -hmm. um, you got to take the time you need to take the time that you need for your career and your moment to to execute how you want to. And he was really really good about just preaching to me like. If these guys are trying to play with you, it's because they're trying to play with you. Take the ring if you need it. Ignore what they're doing. And he was really good about just being, just kind of telling you to narrow in on the experience. It wasn't exactly what, how he said it. He used pretty much he used some stronger language, but yeah, no, I, it, it took a while. He, I got along with him well because I would ask him throw questions. Yep. And he was kind of surprised sometimes, but he enjoyed it. And he would answer my questions. Um, how'd you get along with Thomas Majewski? What did you learn from Thomas? Thomas. Uh, Thomas. I mean, he's yeah. Thomas is great. He, he he didn't speak the best English when I first came out. Yeah. And he was the first person. Let me see. Let me think. I mean, Pol Poland became one of my favorite countries pretty early on. I, I would sure. go to Poland for indoor meets a lot, and they were the small, like really intimate indoor meets. So I had I had a night with. Um, both Adam Nelson and Tomas Majewski, and we, I won the meet indoor, bit gosh, I didn't actually lose a meet in Poland until like 2017. Uh, wow. I was undefeated for like seven years or something. That's cool. Yeah. And, um, and Tomas, that, I think that was one, my first time over there. I threw, I don't know, 2150 something and beat him mm -hmm. in Poland. Wow. And I like the throwing gained me the respect to, to go like, the casino with him and, and I realized that he's just a normal dude. He's just happens to be six foot nine and yeah. Um, one of the best mental athletes just you'd ever meet. But we sat there all night and he just let me ask him questions. And um, he was always just really, really, really welcoming. So I always felt comfortable in Poland. Yeah. Whenever I arrived, he'd like shoot me a text message. Like if you need anything, I'm here. And he's always just really accommodating. And uh, he like, my son was three years old and he had a kid a year before and he gave me like fatherhood advice and he'd help me with like, uh, we, we were at this bar in Boston, my wife and my whole family are up there and we invited him to come um, to dinner with us. And he's just sitting there, his gigantic hand with my son in his hands, doing wow. a shot of vodka and just kind of like enjoying the experience. So, I mean, I had some, some of the coolest experiences I've had in track and field with him. He's That's just cool. a really warm, like welcoming, um, he bought me when I started desert high performance, like this cactus lamp that has a European plug. So now I have oh, that out of my desk. There you so go. That's cool. part of my logo. So we, we still stay in contact because he, he was at Doha the last time and he'll be at the Olympics with, with the Polish Federation. So we still catch up quite a bit and talk quite a bit. And now he's just kind of like showed me that you could not hate someone from another country just because they're from another <laughs> country pretty much sure sure in the way that christian sometimes preached <laughs> uh yeah yeah it, that was I, I was 
always interested at. Hob, what did you learn from Adam Nelson? Um, Adam, 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 uh, Adam was kind of an enigma. Um, he was a little bit of bra- He was a little bit more old school. He was a little. Um, at first, he wasn't sure about me, and then yeah. pretty pretty quickly, when he kind of, uh, my, probably my sophomore year when I threw twenty one seventy in college the first time, mm-hmm. um, he reached out and he said, "It looks like you might be able to do this at the next level," and he wanted to make sure that I didn't get into an agent that was shady, and and he did he made sure that. Um, I was aware of John Godina because Godina was in my area down in, yeah. down in Phoenix and he connected those dots and made sure that I just wasn't kind of led astray. I mean, he, sure. he, he did that his whole career. And then 2016, um, probably like my, when he came back and competed again, um, that's probably when he helped me. I mean, just like mentally the most he's, he's cause I had, I don't know how much you're aware of 2016. Like I had, um, a pretty severe bone bruise on my right side and okay. I have some just degenerative arthritis that was misdiagnosed on my right knee. Oh, so wow. I went through, um, I got like a six inch bone bruise on my femur head going oh, into the Olympic year. And, yeah. um, I went through all the rehab for that and everything. And I'm, I was very much ready for trials. You were talking a little bit about uh, what you, you were, you had some real challenges in 16. Yep. And uh, um, you were dealt dealt with a, a pretty big bone bruise. You said on your femur. Yeah, yeah. So I started with that. Started out the year with that in 2016. I did three rounds of PRP, kind of going back and forth between San Diego and Phoenix, and they were six weeks each. So I'd have to like kind of deload my training for six weeks, and it was just a frustrating process. But I finally got to a point where I was like, I was ready to go into trials, mm-hmm. and I was throwing. 22 and kind of feeling back to normal and i tore my plantaris in my left leg in my oh, shakeout sh- oh when my i got God. when i got to um when i got to hayward field like the first day that i was shaking out wow um and i knew like i didn't know it was my plantaris at the time i knew like i something in my calf felt like i got stabbed yeah. um i just hit the toe board like wrong somehow and my foot just kind of it just just felt like a little pop and um, I wasn't sure what it was and we didn't get an MRI until after. Cause I just, I was like, I'm going to do it either way. So yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. really care what it is. It, it's just pain at this point. It's not going to, my leg's not going to fall off. Yeah. Um, so I got a lot of therapy and, um, <laughs> I was not feeling good and my whole leg was just kind of on fire and I was having like down regulation issues. Like I'd get up on my calf and my foot would go flat cause my calf would just not want to, not want to, sure. yeah. not want to calf basically. Yeah. Um, and I got through prelims and Adam Nelson came up to me in between and he, we just talked for a while and he's like, I've been there, man. Like you deserve to be where you are. And, and he just like reassured me that like, it was my first team that I felt like I could actually miss because yeah. of some things. So it was just kind of like a, a weird, sure. Weird, it was a weird experience. Honestly, it was just something that I never considered going through before. And he was yeah. right there just kind of being, being who I needed, I guess. That's cool. That's yeah. Cool. And it was, it's, it's always been like little individual experiences, but like that, like they all have a certain vibe about them and you know, you'd get something out of them if you asked for it. But that was the first time that he was like, he saw that I had a need and he latched onto it. So, Yeah. Thomas Walsh said really nice things about you, uh, goofy <laughs> things too, about how much he enjoyed your company. And um, we were just talking about competition. I've known Tom for a while, and I've 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 watched seeing him get heated at times. And I just stayed back. Media guys asking really dumb questions or not giving him the respect that he felt that he deserved. I think that started in about. Uh, 15, 2015, right? And and um, and Stubbsy, you know, I would talk to Andy and I'd say, okay, you know, what am I dealing with? Is this like Christian or is this, you know, and he goes, oh, Larry, just talk about the shot put. So we did, you know, we did fine. But um, what was your relationship with uh, Tom on? Mm. Um, so I, we competed against each other for the first time in was on in 2013 when I was I was um, wow. like in, in my 
in my groove kind of. Yeah. And the next year I was setting up, I mean, hopefully setting up to try to take a shot at the world record 14 in the off year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's cause I was just kind of in the zone and I, I remember him wearing his like red Canterbury Jersey, I believe is what he was wearing at that meet. That's all I remember about Tom Walsh from our first time we met. We didn't hang out. Like he went with Val after the meet. Yeah. They were training in Switzerland. Um, and then in SoFi, um, he came up to me before and I was pretty relaxed. I was, I was a lot, a lot more prepared than I was for the first win in Turkey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just kind of knew like whatever anyone throws today, I can outrange them. I'm not worried about, I'm, I'm just focused on winning. So I was a little lighter and he started talking to me and I was like, who's this goofy? Where's he from? And he, he has the fern on and I was like, Oh, it's not, you're not Jacko and you're from New Zealand. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That was like, yeah. That was like our, that was like our first interaction. Wow. And, uh, he he got through prelims with I think like three PBs in a row or something like that. Man, and we got to uh, the final, and well, he's like, "Well, how do you how do you do this thing?" And I was like, you "Just disregard everyone else." And and he's like, "Done." And it was I didn't notice how well he was doing because I was just kind of in my in my zone, and I knew David yeah. was my main my main uh, <laughs> my main concern. Yeah. Um, but. I got done or I was getting done and I saw him PR and I was like, he went into third. He went into medal position, this, this, this kid. And then we get done. And the first thing I get is a big hug from Tom Walsh. He's like, that was great to watch, man. And I was like, yeah, you too. That was, that was crazy. He PR'd by like literally four and a half or five feet. Wow. Or some, yeah. some crazy, some crazy. Yeah, distance. sure. I don't, I don't That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we started talking and, and that was like, our first friendship was his first medal or like the wow. first part of our friendship was his medal. And then kind of, we'd see each other on, on the road and we started rooming together and um, we'd see each other at championships. And then he started having meets in New Zealand in the beginning of 2015. So I, I went down there and, and he or his federation or the meet director, someone paid my appearance fee was that I got to bring Ashley and Charlie, my wife and my son. Oh, for free. cool. So, yeah. Yeah, they put us up for two weeks. Oh, we got nice. Like a New Zealand, a New Zealand adventure, having meets and like, I came because I was. They just wanted to kind of highlight the sport down there, and they they brought me down to help do that. And then as it, it moved along, he he helped me in a lot of similar ways, just just with being who he was later in his career. So That's we cool. we we became pretty. I mean, he's definitely my best friend from my throwing career. Yeah, and. uh I mean, we still are, we own, we run a company together and, uh, it's, uh, it's been interesting with that, with that. I mean, adding like money into the equation, but we, we said going into it that our friendship is the first and foremost. So if anything is awry, that's, that's still there, but no, we, we, yeah, we had prank wars. I've been in New Zealand a few times now and yeah, I mean, it's, it's a easy relationship with Tom. Yeah. That's great. That's great. What what I, there's a theme with you is that you can compete with people and also have a good relationship with people too. And you know, I'm from that old school time. I mean, John Paul is was a good buddy of mine. <laughs> and I remember John going up to Mike Bunsik and going, Hey Mike, your shoulders look tight. And I'd have to turn away and not lose it, you know? And and John was doing that shit all the time. You know, I mean it just and that was that whole and so was Mac, you know, I mean, those guys were like that. You guys seem to be able to compete, but also be able to have uh, a semblance of a human relationship. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I, I feel that's kind of like the evolution of sport. You realize that, I mean, at least I, I realized fairly early that if, if I want the greatest victory for myself, I want you to be at your best. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's not how I thought of it when I first started doing it, like not bothering people and not doing the stuff Christian would do. Yeah. Um, but that's how I started looking at it and realizing like, oh, that is actually, that is actually why I don't really feel like I have a right to try to get in their head and other, other than with my competition or with my sure just kind of hard line competition. I can do it on the first throw and let's see what you can do. And, and I think it became a lot more fun when it just became – 
pure sport versus pure sport and, instead of trying to like hamstring someone to even get into the ring. Um, I want you to do well and I want to beat you when you do well. Like my, when I beat Tomas Majewski and to, uh, David Storl, when I first threw 22 meters, that that's one of my proudest moments because they both PR'd on that day. And wow. I got to, I got to take it still. So that's um, so cool. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of how I think of it now. I, my kids um, that I coach, I preach like FTA, which is, you can think what the F is, them all. Yeah. Um, but that, that is more, don't concern yourself with what they're doing training wise. You can still see them as a person, but don't concern yourself with what they're doing. Just be confident in what you're doing and don't think about the next best thing. Think about what is going to get your career to the next level. And uh, yeah, I think, I think the sport is definitely moving forward in that regard. Like Tom and Ryan Krauser are definitely rivals and yeah. Joe, they get to see each other throw pretty much daily because of social media now. Mm -hmm. And um they kind of understand what each other are doing, but they all have the same goals and they're not going to like, no one's going to try to sabotage each other when they, when this gold medal is handed out and in yeah. August, it's going to be the best person that gets it. It's that's just, there's not going to be any excuses from these guys. They know what happened in Doha. They know they're in for some sort of crazy showdown. And I think I, I just like the, the direction our sports headed both, both men's shot and men's javelin are kind of elevating a little bit. Women's discus yeah. is, is coming up too. Mm -hmm. And I think the rest are going to follow. You see the women's shot going indoor this year, and it's just going to start elevating everybody. I think the men's shot was kind of the lead, the lead for that in the field events. And triple yeah, jump, I, men's triple jump. I try not to miss a throw in the shot, and then I also I've been spending some time with the German with Roller and Johannes when I got to meet uh, Roller's coach in Doha, yeah. and uh, yeah. really liked the guys, and I love their their training and their love of the event. I like it that when they're students of the, the event. Um, I wanted to ask you, was Doha the best shot put competition uh, in a world championship or an Olympic? In oh, yeah. Much time? I, mean, I, I think minus maybe one long jump competition, that was the best field field competition in history. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's just not much you can say. I mean, if you convert down the lines of the decathlon scoring or world record percentages, Mm -hmm. it'd be uh i mean it'd be like three guys jumping what like 875 in the long jump or something like that yeah no you you you've got it what um what did you think of ryan's uh, indoor world record um i mean obviously i mean he he deserved he's deserved it for a long time but you don't really deserve it until you you, you do it and I'd seen him throw 23 meters, like being in the ring in Oslo, probably 27 or 2018. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we've all known for a while that he, he has that in him. Um, but it, it like, that's what, that's what I went through in college with trying to chase that 22 meter mark. You get up there all alone and, and you know, you're going to have to go like five feet further than everyone else in a meet to, to do what you want to do, not just win. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really hard to just, just kind of settle into yourself and execute that, that type of thing. So it's, I mean, I, I sent him a congratulations message like a few days later because I didn't, um, I never liked getting bothered with like, you did like, yeah, Randy was a great shot putter, but I'm the one who is a hundred percent clean yes. and, and like, that's that's what I want for our sport more than anything is get like get rid of the records in the right way get rid of the records yeah. don't talk about them anymore just run them over and, and let them be history yeah. um but I'm I'm happy with with him holding on to it I think it's going to go back and forth with the, the way the sport's moving in the next few years mm -hmm. I think it's going to start getting broken a little not like pole vault probably but <laughs> Um, I think it will be broken. I think the outdoor one will be broken in the next two years, whether it's this year or next year, but, um, it's coming. And so. when I talked to Ryan after the competition, you know, I did a, a zoom thing with him and I said, uh, what was your best throw that day? And he goes, he goes, it was my 21, 23. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, technically 
that one was fantastic. He goes, the record throws weren't there. I want you to take yourself back to when you were competing. Did you have situations like that? Did you have situations where you went, man, this is just a killer throw. God, I wish it had been another meter. Or, I mean, yeah. okay. Yeah. There, I mean, a di- little bit different situations, but I've had some that just got away that either like, you have some that feel kind of good, but you don't hold on to them because you don't think they were, you just get a different feel from a really efficient throw. Yeah. So it gives you a different feedback. And like, as you're in the moment, you're like, Oh, I didn't get a whole lot of that one on my hand. So you kind of let, let the emphasis go on the save to throw. And or at least that's what happened in my head. Usually is I'd not feel it. And then all of a sudden you'd be like, Oh, that, that was actually pretty good. And yeah, that, that ha- I mean, that happens when you have a technical breakthrough in practice, same thing. It's like, you have no reference point for what that feels like. And I've definitely had, I mean, in a different way, I've had throws that got away either slippery rings or like I nailed my entry and I hit the middle and my foot moves an inch. And that kind of just takes you out of your zone and takes you, takes you down a notch. And I've had things like that, but yeah, you can see in, in Ryan, he has to let go of control. He likes control a lot. He likes to know where the shot's going. And when he let, lets go of control, he throws further. He's a little more out of control, but um, we, we've been trying to get him to just go faster for a long time. So it's good to see him just let go and kind of get after that mark. But yeah, I've definitely had that experience. John Paul told me that if I wanted to see how fast the thrower is, watch their feet in the ring. Were you a fast thrower? Yeah, I, I was, I was the, I was the idiot who started that long dynamic wine thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so Krauser, I talked to Krauser all the time. I was, and he told me early in his career that 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 long sleeping wind is kind of it came from kind of what I did to start with, and I was pretty proud of that. That's cool. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing, but it's like, oh, maybe I added something to the sport. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's cool to see like in Tom's technique and in Krauser's technique some of the things that I I I feel like I probably did first because biomechanically they felt like good to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't sure what I was doing. Now I know what I was doing, but, um, like even, even at the end of my career, I still didn't know why I was doing some of the things that, that I was doing. Now I know exactly what technically it was doing for me and I can explain it to other people, but I wish I could go back and, and use some of the tools that I have now, but yeah. Uh, you're 22, 28, um, in Doha in 2013. Um, conditions were pretty darn good. It was nice and warm, uh, yeah. really warm. Um, what do you recall about that throw? Did that one surprise you? Uh, no, I, I threw 22 60 or something in practice the week before. Um, and I was kind of starting to round into the, um, shape that I wanted to be in to kind of try to start, start inching towards the world record in 2014. Mm-hmm. So I, I felt pretty good about, I, I, that was the most sure I've ever been about PR. I think Wow. I was like, I'm, I'm going to hit something pretty good today. And Reese talked to me before he's like, yeah, you're feeling good. Aren't you? Cause I just kind of was walking around like unconcerned with anyone else. Cause I knew I was kind of going to outrange everybody that wouldn't fly today, but <laughs> <laughs> what um, about no, I, felt, I felt great going into it and I was comfortable in that ring. I, I threw and that was one of my first, big meets and Mm -hmm. I threw well there last time I was prepared for it. And I kind of, I wish I would have thrown further, honestly. I mean, you get days like that, probably five days in your career. And uh, I took advantage of it. Obviously I PR'd, but. (laughs) What was the Moscow competition? Like, what do you recall from that? That one's a little, uh, what do you, what do you recall from that? It was one of the, I've been to 72 countries. The only and I love Russia. It was depressing. That's the one, one thing, and it was just a little weird. And I was waiting for some things not to go well, um, yep. because of life. Jim Dunaway was my editor, right? Yep. Jim wrote about the faking of the the javelin in eighty, and a couple of the other things that happened. Yep. Um, and I was. I was open to anything. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if, if um, you guys would get a fair shake or not. And I know it sounds weird, 
you know, and that was the, and I, and, and as a journalist, I'm trying to go, yeah, but James is going, Larry, you, you just gotta, you gotta understand where you're at and what you're dealing with, you know, and how important the sport is. Yeah. It, that was a, that was, yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. I don't, I don't, I don't like to complain about circumstances outside my control. So I've never yeah. really talked about the, that meet with like anyone, but like friends like Tom and stuff like that, that, sure. that I wanted to know. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that, that one, that was rough. Uh, yeah. I don't know how, where you guys were of like what was going on down, on, down, down by us, but like, I took my first throw 2157 and you know, I was the clear, like I was clearly head and shoulders above that entire field. Yeah. I felt like I was, I knew that I was store was in good shape, but like if I did what I should have done and I, I had two throws after he, he had his, his good one. So yeah. I, I still feel like I should have executed better to win, but I was kind of in a weird place because, um, I was warming up and I was warming up around 22 meters and there was a clear, 70 to 80 centimeter gap between what I was throwing and what everyone else was throwing. And we get to the meet, I open up and my and Reese and Corey, Corey Martin are all standing down there. So, um, we're all kind of on the one side and then Storl's a little off by himself and I don't blame Storl for anything I'm about to tell you. It's just kind yeah. of, yeah. It's just it's, it's, he's, he was a victim of circumstance too. So we, we go through the meet and I think we get to like throw, throw number three and he has, he had, they call a foul. So they red flag him. He gets out of the ring and a German photographer comes up and to the, the Russian official and he starts showing him still photographs like, uh, no foul, no foul, no foul. And wow. He, they, I'm watching the field and Tomas is watching the field. The marker left as soon as they said red flag. So he left, yeah. went to the side yeah. of the field. They, the photographer comes in and they're having this conversation and I'm up there and I'm like, this is not okay. And I'm pointing to blue trick. Blue trick was in the stands. He wasn't my coach at the time, like my personal coach, but we had known each other for a while. And Beth Sullivan, the team coach was watching me because I trained at Penn state at the time. And she was the U S head team coach. So I'm like, there's an issue going on right now. I need you guys to be aware of it. But at the same time, I'm getting ready to throw on the next throw. So I'm trying to both get into my mental state and prevent what is seeming like it's going to happen from happening. And that is them white flagging a throw that was just red flagged. And that's what they did. Wow. So he puts up a white flag and I was like, what mark are you going to use? The guy goes out in the field, picks one of my clear warm up throws. They mark it 2173 and I got beat by my own warm up throw. I don't, I don't expect wow. like David to speak up in that situation. Cause I would not have known how to do that either. He's yeah. 22 or 23, but I mean, I'm, I'm over it now. Like money wise, I know it was a lot of money and everything. And I could have gotten appearance fees. I would have gone to the next world championship for free. Um, I've thought about all that, but like, it just took me, I mean, it was an, I didn't think of it as like a country to country type of thing at that, at that time. Yeah. Then afterwards I'm talking to Reese and he's like, well, you know why they didn't give you the benefit of the doubt. And I was like, well, now I do. Oh yeah. 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 No, and we no, had, no. we immediately filed a protest. I, they had like, we had a bunch, a lot of the shot putters saying like, yeah, that happened. Like my FC spoke up and said, yeah, they lost, they left the mark. Like you can't just pick a mark in a world championship. Um, and I had two more throws, so I, I feel like I still should have won. But I, I have, I have uh, definitely that one was not okay with me. But it's not David's fault. I never brought it up because I don't. I never brought it up in the past because I don't want to cause like him to have a bad reputation because he's not sure, sure. not his fault. I would have gone along. I mean, I would have done the same thing. In the in the moment, you're excited about it, and you're like, yeah. no, I didn't foul. Yeah. But, there could have been a better way, give him another throw or something like that. Um, because it was, I mean, it was clear as day that the guy walked away from the mark and he just walked out and popped the thing in the ground and they measured whatever. And it was, yeah, Dave, I mean, his, that throw was 2173. And then his best second throw is 2120 something. And I know he's capable of 2173. So that, that's not the yeah. issue. It's just, yeah. 
Yeah. The it changed. I, I mean, it changed my career path because in 2015 I was hurt, and yeah. then um, I didn't make the 2015 team, and I got reduced for it. You know how all that stuff goes. So it did. I mean, it affected me a lot financially, and I tried not to let it, to let it affect me mentally, like the great injustice of it all, that sort sure. of thing. But yeah, that's that's the fun that we had in Moscow. When you look back at your career, and you're now you're coaching and you're affecting another generation of throwers. Uh, and this is probably our final deep thought. And, and thank you for, one, your honesty, but also I just enjoy talking with you and learning about the event. Um, we're, your coach, it's obviously your throwing is helping you coaching. And I think the coaching has helped you throw in some ways too. Um, so are you a thrower who coaches or a coach who th- or a, a guy who always should have been a coach who was a great, a fine thrower? Um, or were they both just, no, I think, that evolution? I, mean, I, I think my throwing career helps me more. I mean, it, I think I'm a thrower first and I mean, I still throw with the kids mm-hmm. as part of my knee rehab and kind of feeling like if I'm telling them something and it, it's either something I learned from someone else that I hadn't tried myself. I try to try all the cues that like try them on myself. I, I won't always be able to do that, obviously, but um, I, I think I'm an athlete first and I, I use that as my compass for what I, what decisions I make coaching because I try to have like, especially with the pros. Um, I try to put myself in their shoes and try to figure out what they need. The high school kids are a little easier. I feel more just like pure coach with, with the high school kids, because I can just, they're not at the point where they need the thrower side of me to step in and, and kind yeah. of give them any mental advice. So it's, it's kind of different at different stages, but the pros definitely I'm more thrower because I'm trying to feel what they're going through. I, I know what their positions feel like. I know the the path they're going through and, and I, that's why chase came along so fast because I could give her shortcuts for feel Mm -hmm. and things typically no, no one's going to be able to tell you like, this is what it's going to feel like coming around the corner in the back with a new amount of tension, unless you've done it before. So that, that is something that I definitely feel that I do differently from other coaches because I've done it recently and I have a good biomechanical memory of what I needed to do in my throw. So I think the athlete side of it helps me a lot more with the pros and then just kind of looking at how my coaches approach me in my younger career helps me a lot with, with my younger kids, just kind of like, cool. Oh, that's why they did that. That's why they gave it to me in chunks instead of just, cause it's a lot, a lot of the things like if you're teaching a beginner how to spin and, and you show them, this is the end result. And all they see is like a blur of motion with a guy going really fast. They're going to get overwhelmed and they're going to be like, how, how do I get from barely being able to stay on my feet to flying through a ring like Nick, Nick Ponzio does or Chase does? Yeah. Um, so it, it's good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's different at each stage. And I think that's why it's like interesting at, at each stage. Cool. And then when you see that, when you see people click, you can kind of start, I don't know. I relax when you see the click happen because it's, it's finally like work paying off and you can, you can uh, slow down on trying to teach them and just let them experience it after that. So. Well, good luck in your coaching. Thank you for your time today, Ryan. Um, yep. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run, Socialing the Distance. We just featured Ryan Whiting, the 2012 and 14 World Indoor Champ coach at Desert High Performance. Um, have a good day with the kids and with uh, your coach, and great seeing you again. Thanks yeah, you a lot. All right. Yeah, have a good one. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, Run Blog Run. This is uh, Socialing the Distance. This is our epilogue. We just spoke with Ryan Whiting. Um, he is the 2013 World Championship silver medalist, 2012 and 2014 World Indoor gold medalist, um, multiple U.S. champion. He's now the coach at um, Desert High Performance um, in lovely Arizona. And we got to talk with him before he was uh, doing a little bit of homeschooling action in the pandemic for uh, – uh, for his son. Um, always liked Ryan, got to watch his biggest throw ever back in May of 2013 in Doha when uh, he popped a 22 28 
and uh, saw the 22-23 indoor that he threw in Albuquerque in 2014, um, but always um, enjoyed his competing. He was a little different than many of the other guys. He, as he told me today, that um, if he was going to have a motion, it better be a good throw. And uh, it seems to me like through his entire career, he was blessed with really good coaches, and he learned something from me each one. He learned some things that he can improve on too. And he has worked with, started working with athletes that were um, uh, a lot of veterans, a lot of with PTSD and help them find ways to cope with that and to, to uh, be able to enjoy their life and enjoy the other things they were doing. And then he started working with throwers and um, he's got some, Good folks down in uh, Arizona, uh, Chase Ely, he's working with, who spoke very highly of him. Um, I got to talk with him about some of the athletes. He's competed with Christian Cantwell, Adam Nelson, uh, Thomas Majewski, um, and uh, um, let's see who else. Oh, there's a few others in there, too, that uh, he got to talk with. But um, what was fascinating was, as he told us for the first time, the situation that happened in Moscow with him and David Storl, which I was aware of, but it, he had never spoken about it before. And it pretty much cost him the, the gold medal. Um, he doesn't blame anything. It's obviously that he's worked through it. He's a very thoughtful man and uh, a, a thoughtful thrower. And he's important in that whole evolution of the throws. He's very excited about the possibility of the, men's shot in javelin and the women's shot, like it, especially indoor season and how big they're becoming. And the throws are fantastic. And, you know, I come from a distance running background and I fell in love with the javelin um, as a teenager. My heritage is Hungarian. And I remember watching Miklos Nemeth throw in uh, 1976 and do that huge world record on his first throw. I've got that series of pictures somewhere and I've got a picture of Miklos's dad, Imra, who won in 1948 in the hammer. Um, and always loved the hammer and the shot. Um, always thought distance runners and throwers got along because they like to drink beer and eat a lot and tell stories among other things. Um, but Ryan is, is, is a, a unique person in this whole throw area. And uh, Tom Walsh, uh, from New Zealand said really good things about him too. So we got to see uh, uh, a more contemplative Ryan Whiting and perhaps that's what we'd have seen all along if we had talked to him. But uh, I, I encourage you to watch this closely. There's a lot of lessons. Uh, we extended it a little bit. Um, but Ryan, thank you very much. Thanks for your honesty. Thanks for your thoughtfulness. It always means a lot. This is Larry Eater with uh, Run Blog Run. This is Socialing the Distance. This is our epilogue. We featured Ryan Whiting, the 2012 and 14 World Indoor Champion, the 2013 silver medalist from Moscow. Uh, stay safe. If you like Run Blog Run, like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you love us, subscribe on the YouTube. Talk to you soon.